Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. We're broadcast on Great Plains Television. That's channel 26.1, Sunday mornings at 8.30 and again at 4.30. Also, you'll find all the episodes at my site, wichitaliberty.org. This episode, all the back episodes for each episode, I produce show notes, which uh, uh, contain links and charts and things like that to the topics of today, and also a great deal of other information that's available at wichitaliberty.org. Our guest today, Sedgwick County Commissioner Richard Ranza. He represents District 4, which is uh, Central Wichita, including downtown, near Northeast Wichita, North Wichita, Northwest Wichita, and the towns of Mays, Valley Center, and Park City. He was elected in 2010 and re-elected in 2014. He's a graduate of Wichita State University, a veteran of the Persian Gulf and Iraq Wars, and before service on the County Commission, he worked as a physician physician assistant with uh, orthopedic surgeons there working in the operating room. So, Richard, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. Your colleague, former colleague, and now colleague again, Carl Peter John, uh, the, formerly of the Sedgwick County Commission. Your service overlapped by what, about five years or? Uh, oh, six years. Six years, okay. So, i uh, served together uh, for that. So, there were a couple of issues earlier this year at the County Commission. Carl and I talked briefly about them, but one had to do with the mill levy, which of course is the tax rate that's applied to property, both personal and real property in Sedgwick County and really probably across the, uh, uh, the country there. Um, what happened with that issue? Well, uh, uh, back in 2006, the county voted, this is before Carl and I, either one, either one of us were in here, voted to raise the, the mill levy, about two and a half mills. It was the largest property mill levy increase in Sedgwick County in its history. That would have been about 10%, I think. I, if, I if think it was, in that uh, around that. And uh, it was done without voter approval, which is something I and uh, uh, Commissioner Peter John have all, both supported. Um, now, since that time, I think as a result of that, about three commissioners lost their job. And since that time, that mill levy increase had been reduced a few times, but it hadn't totally been erased. And mm -hmm. so... Uh, a couple of years ago, um, the commission voted to, in 2000, uh, I think 23, to bring that down back to that same 2006 level. Uh, that gave us far, far enough time to, to plan for that, plus it was it coincided with some timing when some bonds would have come off and made it easy to, to go ahead and reduce that mill levy because we wanted to, you know, make that commitment that we're not going to increase the mill levy uh, without voter approval. And so we, we did that a few years ago and there was a recent uh, an attempt in the commission to reverse that. And um, it's interesting that it ended up on the agenda. Usually that indicates there's a majority of commissioners that want to do that. They were going to reverse it, but I think we had some discussion and, and the word got out to the public and I think the commissioners heard back from the public and that ended up uh, failing basically uh, unanimously. So, so this commitment place. or at least intent to reduce the mill lab in, in the future is still the policy of the commission. But Carl, you've explained to me that the county commission and the city council for that matter doesn't really set a mill levy. So how does this mill levy that, that determines how much property tax you pay, how does that get set? Well basically local governments vote and establish budgets. So they decide amount. to spend a certain amount of money. And then it becomes a mathematical formula. And interestingly enough, the person who actually operates the formula is the county clerk. Mm -hmm. So I've kidded our county clerk, Kelly Arnold, about the fact that he's the one setting the mill levy, not only for Sedgwick County, but for all the municipalities and all, basically all the local governments, townships, mm -hmm. and everybody else in Sedgwick County. And I think that's one of the areas that state law ought to be changed because as an elected official, having done that for eight years, I thought that we ought to own the mill levy and we shouldn't be in a position because unfortunately one of the problems that exists Bob when we pass a budget it's subject to technical revision well unfortunately these revisions have a tendency to go up and on my city property tax bill I looked back about a decade going back to 2007 and even though the increases have often been just a fraction of a mill 
uh, over 10 years had been a half mil increase. Well, you're starting, you know, the old joke in Washington was a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. Well, a fraction of a mil here and a fraction of a mil there is real money on your property tax bill. You know, over at, this, at the city hall, the city of Wichita, they boast that they've not raised a mill levy for 20 or some years. And it's true, they've never voted to say, let's make the mill levy go up. But instead, they decide to spend a certain amount of money and they kind of have to guess what the assessed value of all the taxes will be. But almost every year that mill levy creeps upwards. I don't think it's an accident at all. And over about a 20 year period, that mill levy has gone up by 4%. Now people say, well, 4%, I mean, inflation has gone up. That's not very much, but no, this is a rate that's then applied to things whose value goes up with inflation and other things like that. So that 4% is a real burden, I think. Well, and you compound it with the fact that the mill levy is only part of the equation. As a property owner here in Sedgwick County, it's the appraisal process, and if the appraised value goes up, your mill levy can be flat, but your property tax bill can go straight up depending upon the appraisal. Now, Richard, Commissioner Ranzaw, I'd be interested in your thoughts in terms of does property taxes in Kansas need reform? And uh, if so, some of the things Bob and I have talked about are directions to go. What do you think? Well, we're going to ask Richard to hold on for that thought for a moment while we take a commercial break. And we'll get to that when we get back. I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, and our guest this week, uh, Cedric County Commissioner Ranzon, of course, Carl Peterjohn, our uh, co-host. So, Richard, before the break, Carl had asked about uh, the need for property tax reform at the state of Kansas level. Right. Well, I'm a big fan of voter approval for tax increases, and I know a few years ago the state did pass some laws de dealing with that. Some people call it a tax lead, but tax lead, I really call it voter empowerment. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, and I, I supported that legislation, the problem is, problem is there's so many loopholes in that law that it, it really isn't all that effective. And I would like to see uh, the state go back and fix some of those loopholes to, to, to really give it some teeth and, and empower the voters. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't realize, I prepared some figures, and these will be in the show notes, of the property tax that a regular person in a Wichita neighborhood pays, 46% uh, of their property tax goes to the school district. Uh, the city of Wichita and Sedgwick County are pretty close, 27% to the city, 25% to Sedgwick County, and 18% to the state of Kansas. Of course, the state gets a uh, you know 6.5% sales tax plus uh, uh, income tax also as well. But along with that debt limit, uh, or, or, well, there was the debt limit. That was the companion issue kind of to the mill levy. So um, there, Central County does have a debt limit, and there was a proposal to increase that earlier this year, and that legislation did pass. That's correct. A few years ago when we did the mill levy uh, uh, resolution, we also pa passed uh, the debt limit, and mm -hmm. this limits how much we can borrow. Mm -hmm. I, I, the previously, our policy was extremely high, and it really did nothing. And I think, and it's been my opinion that we have at times in the past borrowed habitually at the county and, and in some ways uh, kind of create, dug ourselves in a hole with, with some borrowing and we did it unnecessarily. There's certainly a time to borrow and a time to pay cash. And so we discussed that issue and implemented a policy that limited how much we could borrow. Uh, this is well thought out uh, uh, policy and it was going to be tapered in again over time. Uh, but it still it gave us enough leeway that we could borrow when we needed to. In fact, for example, this year, under the current policy, uh, or the previous policy that, uh, that was recently rescinded, we could borrow $20 million. Well, there was an effort that succeeded by a 3-2 to two vote to change that and actually raise that debt policy, even though we didn't have any reason to do it. Uh, supporters of this couldn't give us a list of projects they wanted to borrow. We had plenty of money uh, over the next three years. I think the number was around $60 million we could borrow under that policy, the previously existing policy. So uh, we kind of, you know, I don't, don't even think the federal government raises the debt limit without a reason, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, 
we did it, and, and that causes me concern because it makes me wonder if there aren't some plans that I'm not aware of to borrow some money in the future that we may or may not really need to do. Yeah, and it's kind of like you get a credit card limit with or a credit card with a, a big number on the credit limit. You think, oh, well, I'll never use that, but then oftentimes people end up spending all of that. Exactly. Well, well let me ask you, Richard, uh, uh, because if we if we had the ability to borrow right now sixty million dollars. Would the new policy that increased that by about 25 percent take us up to 75 or a different number? I think over the next few years, um, I should have I should have brought those numbers. I thought it went up to high as high as uh, something, yeah, like, that, so, something yeah. like that. Maybe 70. It really there was also another side issue of how you interpret what should be included in debt and, and shouldn't. It could have been as high as 120 million, but. Um, I think at the very least it's going to be at least a 75 or something like that, and I don't really see the reason why. Well, that side issue was that the, uh, and this is kind of a, a nerdy thing, I suppose, but the debt limit was pegged to the amount of county spending each year, while a lot of cities, I know the city of Wichita, I believe the debt limit is pegged to the amount of property in the city, which generates the property tax, which is the major way that the city would uh, pay off these bonds. So, but there didn't seem much appetite to tackle that ep that issue, except from you and Commissioner Howell, was there? Well, and I think Commissioner Howell was going to make that recommendation in that meeting, but unfortunately, the debate was cut off, and we never had that opportunity to have that conversation. Yeah. That's really sad because when I was had the privilege of being on the commission, uh, we had some extended meetings, but. Everybody got a chance to not only speak, but to make the motions. And uh, Commissioner Hall's motions, um, he was trying to see if there was any way of, if there was a way of kind of compromising between the sides on the commission. And I think that was very unfortunate what happened. And muzzling commissioners, I don't think, was a very good precedent. And you know, across at City Hall, because those people are technically half-time employees, they make about a half-time, you know, part-time salary. They complain all the time about the length of meetings, but Cedric County Commissioners are paid, I think, a pretty handsome salary. And if they have to sit in a meeting all day long, I don't see what's wrong with that, if we can get some good legislation or ordinances out of that. I, I would agree. There's two mandatory meetings that we have. That's a staff meeting on Tuesday, and, mm -hmm. that's, and then the televised BOCC meeting on Wednesday. And I think we should be willing to stay there as, as, as long as necessary to hear the de debate and have a full discussion of all the issues. And now there's also been some talk about how if the meeting's long, you have to pay a few extra dollars to KPTS television to broadcast the meeting. But, um, you know, I think uh, if, if we're handling important issues, I think it's a good idea to get it right. Same thing up in Topeka. They always talk about, you know, the waste of an extra long legislative session. But uh, the cost is really small compared to the cost of getting something wrong. So um, now let's take a halftime break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about an issue the County Commission has to take on next week, which is a tax increment financing district. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with Cedric County Commissioner Richard Ranzaw and of course our co-host Carl Peterjohn. So coming up this week on May 10th at the County Commission meeting, um, you're going to tackle or at least uh, consider the county's role in the process of formulating a TIF or tax increment financing district. Now I think I can explain to our viewers as simply as possible what a TIF district is. It's first of all a geographic district. You draw lines you know, around a district on a map. Then somebody, I think it's the treasurer or anyway, somebody calculates how much property tax is being paid each year right now at the time of formation and that's called the base. Then as time goes on and stuff gets built, the value of the property will rise, more taxes will be paid, and that difference between the taxes being paid and what that base was is called the increment. You know what this is, Carl, don't you? Arkansas increment. PowerPoint, yeah. <laughs> Arkansas yeah. PowerPoint. So that difference there, the increment, is plowed back through two different ways to the TIF district for the benefit of that TIF district. Normally that increment in property tax would go to, well, the state, the city, the school district, and the uh, county in varying proportions. So what's wrong with that, Richard? It seems like a great way to get stuff done. Well, 
On the surface, it, it may. Uh, now, what people need to understand is that taxes that would normally go to the county and the city, I mean, the school district, let's say, then goes to the city to pay whatever project they're, mm -hmm. they're talking about. Um, by taking that money away, then we have less money to provide for the services that we need to provide. Now, mm -hmm. the argument in favor of this is, is this is going to be new new taxes, new new property taxes, new properties, and, and so we'll have extra money. And so we're just spending the new money. We're not losing anything. The problem is there's been research uh, with respect to retail TIS, which is what we're talking about, is what this does is it just redistributes where people spend their money from one retail area to another retail area. Mm -hmm. So the TIF area then will, will increase in activity and be developed, but it's to the detriment of the other places within the city and the county, so their businesses don't do as well. And so while there's increased revenue from that TIF, the property taxes and values of properties outside that will go down or not increase as fast as what they normally have. Mm -hmm. And so it's really not a, not a net plus, it's really, really net zero or sometimes even less. Mm -hmm. The problem is that is that negative impact is so dispersed over the rest of the county that's hard to, to see and appreciate. And of course, nobody goes back and tries to evaluate what that was because they don't want to talk about the negative impacts of that. Well, let, let yeah. me jump in and, yeah. and ask the question, though, because we've had TIF subsidy districts here in Wichita and some of the suburban communities for quite a while. And the history of them, the numbers I've seen, is really not very good. Uh, I don't know, is there any more recent data than uh, from a couple of years ago was the last time I saw data. Frankly, the TIF districts weren't reaching their goal in almost every case and a lot of cases they were actually uh, hadn't hadn't gotten any anywhere near the development that was projected when they founded those districts. There's been some cases like that but as to Richard's point about economic growth in the region as a whole let's show that chart about the um, the growth of jobs in the Wichita metropolitan statistical area which is dominated by Sedgwick County and the city of Wichita and as you can see on that chart uh, the Wichita is the bottom line and it's lagging behind both the state of Kansas and the country as a whole and unfortunately as time goes on the gap between Wichita's growth and the nation's growth is getting bigger so we're not catching up we're getting further away and I don't know if we can attribute all of that and blame it all to TIF districts but it, it, we have a lot of other intervention into economic development maybe some of that's at fault too but we're just not growing like we should have so you can kind of get the idea why some politicians say let's do this type of stuff but then on the other hand we see that sometimes it doesn't really work very well broadly speaking well I, I think you're right and um, sometimes the politicians don't want to know the data that you've given and, and it's not talked about a lot there is studies that indicate that communities that you use TIFs um, grow slower than those that do not and and like you say though we can't necessarily attribute the slow all the, the slow growth to TIFs it is disappointing given the number of incentive programs that we've had throughout the years that we're not doing better than, than what we are because every year uh, we're told how great these things are doing but mm -hmm. it um, it didn't seem to really pan out and the hard thing, as you mentioned, Richard, is that uh, in a TIF district, we're concentrating a lot of government benefit in usually a fairly small area. Something does get done. We get new buildings. We get um, old buildings like the Ambassador Hotel are renovated into something new. And it's real easy to see that. You can have a ribbon cutting. You can have groundbreaking ceremonies. But looking at the city as a whole, everything is dispersed, and it's very difficult to... Uh, let's say to find the people that didn't get a job because revenue was taken away from one place and directed to another. That, that's very true. That is the, the difficulty in all this. There's, there are ribbon cutting ceremonies and all the sound bites and the TV coverage. Uh, but all the people out there who lose their jobs or don't get a job that wasn't created that could have been or a waitress that has to cut back her hours That's because right. there's not as many people at the restaurant. Mike Pompeo called all that photo op economics, and I'm tempted to say, let's have a law against ribbon cuttings and groundbreaking ceremonies for government-funded projects, but then again, uh, that wouldn't be very good. Well, we're going to take one moment off for another commercial break, and then we'll be back with the last uh, segment of Wichita Liberty t TV for this week.
Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm your host, Bob Weeks. Our guest, Richard Ranzov, the Sedgwick County Commission, and Carl Peterjohn, our uh, co-host. So, you know, one of the things about TIF districts is uh, that makes it difficult to evaluate is we're not really giving. We're not, the city's not writing a check really and spending an appropriation, although they do do that sometimes. But uh, the property owners are in fact paying their fair share of property taxes. It's just that these property taxes have either already been spent to benefit the district and we're paying back bonds, or sometimes that property tax is simply rerouted back to the property owners. So, um, and then there's the corresponding idea, which is the but for principle, in that nothing's ever going to happen on that vacant block in downtown Wichita but for a TIF district. And I wonder why can't we have things in Wichita unless we have to do some sort of subsidy? Well, I, I think we can. I think there's a lot of development that happens on it all the time in various parts of the, of, of the city and the county. Uh, we just have to allow the free market to work. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. when uh, politics gets involved, th then uh, s sometimes uh, you know, elected officials like to get devolve, involved and make things happen and, 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 and get support for that. Often it's to help politically connected individuals or developers mm -hmm. that can then also then compete with other parts of the community that don't get those same incentives and that's that's the troubling part of this yeah and sometimes those other uh, these incentives can be large you know I think one of the well probably the nicest retail development in Wichita is the waterfront at 13th and Webb Road and you know some people on the TIF districts because the TIF money a lot of it goes to infrastructure streets sewers and stuff like that and they say it's just infrastructure this is what cities do anyway but I went back and looked at all the city ordinances that were related to the waterfront development of 13th and Webb Road and there was about 3.3 million dollars spent on that spent by the owners of that property. For example, there's a waterfront parkway, a very nice boulevard uh, stretching around maybe a half mile from 13th Street to Webb Road. That cost almost $1.7 million to build. Not paid by the city of Wichita, paid for by the developers of that development and then deeded to the city. So they're paying for all their own infrastructure, street lights, uh, water distribution systems and so forth, but subsidized developers don't have to do that. That's right, and that sets up an unlevel playing field. So obviously if you can have a development and not have to pay all the costs that everyone else does, then you're at a competitive advantage compared to everybody else. And uh, that's part of the problem that exists with incentives and um, why those individuals who develop without incentives, you know, ha have a problem with some of these things going on, and I think rightfully so. And when you look at the waterfront, uh, you know, not to relentlessly promote it, but some of the retail or restaurant things that Wichita really wanted bad, like a P.F. Chang's, a high-end Chinese restaurant, and then a Whole Foods market, those went to the waterfront, not to a city subsidized development. Well, it's been interesting because the city's talked about trying to get a grocery store in the downtown area. And I look at grocery stores popping up on their own. And we had a TIF district, this is before Richard joined the commission, I believe, uh, that uh, um, in Plainview, in one of the poorest parts of Wichita. And I thought that that would be a very cautionary example for the commission and the city council going forward to consider them. If TIF districts are really good, why don't we make the whole county a TIF district? That is the thing. I mean, if by forgiving taxes or redirecting taxes, if we can have so much development, we should be doing more of this, really. You look at star bonds, which reroute sales tax, community improvement districts, which allow uh, a geographic area to charge up to another two cents per dollar of sales tax. What are the other, there, I mean, there's even more, or industrial revenue bonds, all sorts of tax abatement programs. You know, we do all of that in Wichita. Remember when Boeing left Wichita, Carl Brewer was the mayor then, and he and a member of the legislature, Jim Ward, stood up and said, over 20 or five or whatever years, we've given $678 million of tax breaks to Boeing, and now they're picking up and going to Oklahoma City and San Antonio. Right, and, and some of these developments get multiple tax or tax programs or tax mm -hmm. incentives. So they'll pile one, two, or three or more uh, incentive programs into the same one. And, of course, they're going to benefit and they're going to grow, but we always have to keep in mind that that's to the detriment of everyone else, and other people have to compete with mm -hmm. that. And 
in just the moment we have left, Richard, so cities d uh, d establish a TIF district. What's the role of the overlapping jurisdictions like the county and the school district? Well, we basically can take a look at this and analyze the financing proposal and see if it's good for the Cedric County. And if we say yes, then it'll proceed. In fact, if we do nothing, uh, it'll proceed. We have 30 days from the time it, the, the city council passes this to, to, to make that decision. But we can, if we determine that the proposal, the funding aspect of it, hurts Cedric County or uh, could be done in other ways, um, then we can vote no, and that would stop that portion of the funding for that project. And I think the county's done that a couple times in the past. In one case, I think it, the TIF was reformulated a little bit, and then it did pass. Uh, the school, Wichita School District, or whatever school district's affected by the TIF, has a similar opportunity to, to veto. But in my experience, school districts just don't want to get involved well, in and, that. And the, the state, I believe, holds them harmless on the That's what side. they say. And then the state of Kansas itself, but the 21 and a half mills, that's not subject to rerouting by TIF and some of the other things like that. So, well, guys, we're out of time today, uh, as we always run out of time so fast. Carl Peter John, thank you. Sedgwick County Commissioner Richard Ranzaw, thank you. We'll be back next week for another Wichita Liberty TV.